Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Maroon Friday edition of the Yard. Hope you're wearing maroon today. I'm not so far. I may, I may have to put a light jacket on or something just so I can participate. I can't promote it. And then not be in a situation where, um, you know, <laughs> I can't, uh, you know, be a hypocrite here, right? I just can't. So let's celebrate Maroon Friday, not just this Friday, but every Friday. Let people know where we stand. We are proud to be Bulldogs. I've never had a day in my life that I was ashamed to be a Bulldog, ever. I, I read that sometimes. People are like, oh, I'm embarrassed to be a fan. I, never, ever, ever. It's part of being in a family. I've never been af- af- afraid or ashamed to be a Robertson. Love my dad. Love my extended family. You know, just, I don't know. Maybe I've got a little thicker skin than most. Maybe my, maybe my level of commitment is a little bit different. But uh, I know people deal with uh, adversity in different ways. But uh, it has been a very challenging week for all of us. We're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time today um, you're talking about Coach Mike Leach. I mean, and that's out of respect for you all and, and everybody else, too. I mean, we've already done a couple big shows and spent basically the full content of those shows talking about the loss of Mike Leach. And in some ways, it does kind of feel almost disrespectful to try to turn the page a little bit. But, uh, you know, we have to. I mean, life does go on. Does it mean that we don't love Mike Leach or appreciate his contributions to Mississippi State football? But you know, we got to begin to start moving forward. Now, the memorial for Mike Leach will be on uh, Tuesday at 1 o'clock in Humphrey Coliseum. They are expecting a near-capacity crowd. So if you plan to be here, get here early. No clue how that's going to go. None at all. But it is going to be a memorial service. Uh, I understand Mike Leach's family will be there. You certainly would hope so. And a lot of uh, coaches and players and people that have been a part of uh, Coach Mike Leach's life will be there and be a part of the program. I'm not going to uh, share all the details of what I know because, you know, things could change. There's travel plans to consider and things like that, and people have busy schedules. But uh, there will be a lot of people there to pay their final respects um, to Mike Leach and to his family. And uh, I understand that the family is very excited. I think only one of his kids can't make it. uh, But the reality of it is is that we're going to have a lot of people there so we can love on them a little bit and understand that uh, we share in their loss. Of course, our, our, our share in that loss is, is pales in comparison to theirs, but it's a chance for us as a fan base and people to love Mike Leach to be here and celebrate his life and let them know that, what he meant to us. And that's, that's probably the biggest legacy anybody can leave, you know, and I see that reel on Instagram and Facebook all the time. I don't know who it is. I don't know. They're, they're, they're interviewing Keanu Reeves. I don't watch political stuff. Life is too short. Death is certain to waste time on that. But they ask Keanu Reeves what happens when we die. And Keanu Reeves says, I know that those who love us will miss us. And might be the greatest answer of all time. You know, I, I, I believe that, you know, the, you know, the biblical stance on this. But I think so much about the focus of our energy on the living, Right. You know, Mike Leach sadly is gone you know, forever. He is. But our love and admiration and respect for him in many ways has to kind of transition to his family and so and the coaches. And there will be some coaches that have grown his staff that will take jobs elsewhere. There may be some that aren't retained. There have been some developments in many respects when it's come to how Mississippi State's handling this coaching situation. Uh, that's going to be a big focus of our show today. But, uh, again, if you're planning to be here on Tuesday, make sure you get here early. Make sure. Not sure how they're going to handle the crowds. I really don't. Because I I don't know what to expect. I mean, you really don't. You really don't know what to expect. But uh, I don't know how long the program's going to go. Maybe an hour or so. Maybe a little bit longer. We'll see. I know that there are going to be people that are going to speak, some dignitaries of sorts, some people that have uh, contributed to Mike Leach's life and success that will get up and share some stories. And there'll they'll, they'll be some tears. There'll be some laughter. And uh, we'll say goodbye. And for those of you that can't be here, I think they're going to stream it. I think. I don't know if the SEC network picks it up. I don't know how any of that's going to be handled. As we get closer to Tuesday, we'll have some more information for you. I also want to give you guys a programming note. There is a good chance that the Wednesday show will be recorded um, 
Maybe Wednesday morning. Uh, we'll see because uh, I am uh, I'm going to make a trip out to New Mexico. Kind of an unplanned thing, but uh, after the memorial, I'm going to head west and get as far as I can go, and then lay down Tuesday night and probably get up and record your show on Wednesday. Now, if if I sleep late, I'm not going to record the show until Wednesday evening. So just go ahead and be prepared. Maybe Wednesday night. So if, if you wake up Wednesday, you don't have a show then you'll have on Wednesday night. Just kind of give, giving you a heads up. And then I'll record uh, on schedule. You know, I'll probably do Friday show Thursday night. And we'll, of course, do Monday show on Monday. But um, just a programming note for next week. You know, the, the, um, you know, the wife is out there. And so, you know, we would both be alone on Christmas. And I, I just can't stand that. I'm just not going to – I'm not going to do it. I'll do whatever i got to do. Just absolutely not going to do uh, – be in a situation where we're both alone on Christmas. So I'm going to go be with her. Uh, and I'll be back. But uh, I'll work from out there. We'll do shows. We'll do articles, all that kind of stuff. That's the great thing about my job. I can pretty much work from anywhere. Won't be too much longer. We'll have a bowl game, too. So looking forward to that. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I am eating there tonight. So if you're dining at Bulldog Burger Company in Starkville, there's a chance you may see me. How about that? That'd be nice. Come up and say hello. We'll hug each other's necks. Promise each other we're going to make it. Because you know, we're family. We are. And what better place to bring your family for a night out of great cuisine than Bulldog Burger Company? There's always something on the menu for the kids and for the grown-ups. I've been thinking about those wings. Let me get the wings. It's always weird, too, though, like, you know, being the bearded person. You know, sometimes you can't eat eat chicken wings in, in, uh, in public, you know. But I do like them. I encourage you to try them next time you're in town. But always get the spring rolls as your appetizer. Get that great restaurant quality hamburger. You'll be glad you did. My favorite is the Pimentology Ad Bacon. But I love the Smokehouse, the Bryant, the Lauren, the Bulldog, the Fresh and 15, the Mission. I get the Pico de Gallo on the sides. You may like it on there. I'm not a big onion guy. You, know, you think you know my policy about that? But whatever you're craving, you can get that bad boy handled at Bulldog Burger Company. Get the dessert to go. Get that chocolate shake ordered. You can ride that ride home with a smile. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, and Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Be sure and check them out today. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, since we were together, Coach Zach Arnett is now your head football coach at Mississippi State. You know, we talked about that possibility on the last show. And I want to clarify a couple things. A lot of people are like, hey, I guess, Steve, I get the sense you're not on board. I'm absolutely on board. I just wanted to give you both sides of the discussion uh, on, on the show. I wanted to make sure that you guys understood that this is the risk you take by promoting Zach, and these are the reasons you do it. We're going to get both sides of the story. I'm not going to get on here and just paint you a happy picture and, and just you know make you a, a, a giraffe out of a balloon and, and make you smile and laugh. Zach Arnett's a first-time head coach. Does that mean he's not capable? Absolutely not. I think Zach Arnett is brilliant. I think it was just a matter of time before he became a head coach, whether it be here or somewhere else. And as I shared with you guys before, in many respects, I think Zach Arnett was kind of the unofficial coach in waiting. I know John Cohen absolutely loves him and his trajectory as a coach. That's one of the reasons you sign that guy to multiple year deals with a big buyout. You want to keep him here and keep him as your coordinator. And in the event something happens, you got a guy that knows your culture, right? So, yeah, I, I'm on board with it, completely on board with it. I just think there are going to be some challenges as he kind of acclimates to a new role. As I mentioned, he, he didn't have everybody in the building working for him. Now he does. You know, before he had to worry about his GAs and his student assistants and his assistant coaches. Well, now he's got to worry about the entire thing. So there will be an acclimation process. Now, of course, that's why you have a chief of staff, too. That's why you got Matt Dudak and Brittany Dackery and people like that. They kind of manage those people for you, too. You know, Mike Leach didn't like having to deal with all that stuff either. Mike just wanted to coach football. And so I suspect that you'll see maybe a hierarchy of support staff similar to what you had under Leach. There will be some changes, okay? There will absolutely be some changes. When you, I mean, think about your own lot in life, right? It's like, hey, well, if I ever got this job, this is what I would do. I would hire this person. I would fire this person. I would replace this person. I would shift this person in a different direction. That's what happens in life and in business. And so to expect everybody to just kind of stay where they are, that's just not, that's not realistic. And there will be some coaches that uh, get other opportunities and may like to go elsewhere. Don't take it personal. It's just part of the business. I don't expect you'll see any major changes between now and the ballgame, unless somebody else gets a job 
that they just simply can't turn down. And that's not going to be an indictment on Zach Arnett. I can tell you everybody on the staff loves Zach Arnett. They do. But again, this makes sense. With signing day, the signing December signing period beginning on Wednesday, we couldn't go into that, not being able to answer kids' questions. You got other coaches, other programs, or people on behalf of those programs that are out reaching out, trying to poach some of your players. And I have reached, um, I have some findings, and I've shared those findings with other people. We'll see where it goes from there. I also heard from uh, seven or eight, I lost count, seven or eight other college programs, staffers and or coaches with seven or eight other programs, expressing their disgust at the fact that some people would be out there and trying to poach our players just over 24 hours after they've announced that our coach has passed away. It's disgusting. One coach whose name you know said, it's a shame what our profession has become. I mean, so many have said, Steve, if we hear anything or if we can do anything to help you, if you have questions of us, you let us know. At another off-the-field staffer at another SEC school that reached out to me and said, hey, it better not be anybody on our staff. It better not be anybody connected to us because I'll take this information to the head coach himself. And so we've gotten a lot of support. And, of course, there's always some idiots. There's so many people out there. I'm going to say this as nicely as I can. There are some people that do not need to have access to social media because they are absolutely too stupid. Absolutely too stupid. Often in error, never in doubt, and they embarrass themselves at every turn. I had some some fan, I'm not going to say which school, message me, well, this is perfectly legal. No, it's not. It's not legal. It's against NCAA bylaws out the wazoo. You cannot contact another team's player until it goes into the NCAA transfer portal. Period. Those are the rules. You can't contact him and then recruit him and try to encourage him to get into the portal. That's called tampering, as our folks up the road at Ole Miss know. And so I get tickled sometimes, like people are like, oh, you you got a couple of critics. I don't care. My record speaks for itself. When I sink my teeth into something, and I know that I've got something there, I continue the fight until it's finished. And so we've thrown a few punches here. We've had some people give us some information. A couple of those people are reluctant to go on the record, and I understand that. At the end of the day, it's not about me writing a story. It's about getting this resolved. I had a couple people contact me and said, hey, they really don't want their names made public, but here's what happened. Well, that's all you really want in the first place. Then you can take that information, you can forward it to the people uh, that uh, can handle all this discreetly and get it taken care of. That process is underway. I don't care what other people say on message boards. It doesn't matter to me. I'm right, they're wrong. Again. They can get on their little shows and their little podcasts and you know, they can you know, pedal out some tater logs and things like that, but the reality of it is this. This is happening. And now we have witnesses to support that it's happening. And so my hope now that Zach Arnett has been promoted to head coach will kind of die away. But for these naive people to get out here on social media and say, oh, well, that's just how things work today. No, it's not. It's not. Now, that's not to say that, let's say for an example, like let's take... Let's take Makai Polk, okay? So let's say Makai Polk had a trainer, and this is all hypothetical. Makai Polk was underutilized at Cal, and so he may contact a high school coach. He may contact a trainer. He may contact a 7-on-7 coach. He may just have somebody to act on his behalf. I'm thinking about getting in a portal, but I don't want to jeopardize my situation at Cal. I need to know that I got somewhere to go because not everybody that goes in the portal – has a place to sit when this crazy game of musical chairs is over. When the music stops, you might be stuck paying for college and not playing college football. That's a reality for a lot of people. There are thousands of kids in the portal that will not sign a scholarship here in the next six weeks. You don't want to be one of those. So you have somebody act on your behalf and maybe reach out at some other schools and say, hey, Makai's thinking about going in the portal. If he does, would you have interest? I don't think anything's wrong with that. 
What I do have a problem with is some third party with no connection to a coach or to a player or to a family basically going out here acting as a street agent. Oh, well, hey, I know this coach at this school, at Blue Mountain State. They're willing to take you. They can give you X number of NIL dollars if you get in the portal. Anybody that is okay with that, I got to question your intelligence. We've already loosened the restrictions so ridiculously loose. Why isn't it enough? Those are the questions that I ask myself. At what point do we say, okay, listen, we have to have some measure of law and responsibility around here, right? I mean, are we, just, are we basically just going to get together and pick teams in the summer nowadays? Okay, I pick this guy, this guy, you pick this one. And then, okay, now, you're, okay, now you move to Starkville. It doesn't make any sense. And it's like, like the old expression, you give somebody an inch, they think they're a ruler. So all of a sudden, we've allowed for the transfer portal to exist. We've cleared the path for immediate eligibility without the waiver process. We've opened up the door for NIL for people can profit from their name, image, and likeness. And now people are kind of coupling that with the transfer portal. So at what point do we say, Okay, we have to have some rules and some parameters here to protect the schools. We have gotten so student-athlete-centric right now, there's nothing being done to protect the schools. You know, we finally put these NCAA transfer windows in because it's not no longer do you have to, like, you, you can go coach your kids again. I mean, how many times have you seen a situation where, you know, somebody just goes and gets in the portal middle of the season? I'm not a fan of that at all. What you're really telling me is you're a quitter. You get in a portal in the middle of the season, you have quit on your team. Now, I know there are some extenuating circumstances, right? There may be a situation between a coach and a player that can't be reconciled. The best thing to do is get in the portal. Well, now you've got a window where you can get in. But you know, before, you get out there and, you know, a coach hurts your feelings, I'm just going to get in the portal. I'm going to be all passive-aggressive here. You know, screw them. I'm just going to get in the portal. Then everybody freaks out. Everybody's upset with the coaching staff. You don't even know what happened. You don't even know what happened. You just know he went and got in the portal. So we immediately feel the need to blame our school, our coaching staff, our administration. I can tell you, I'm not going to mention any names, I can tell you that a handful of players that got into the transfer portal from Mississippi State since its creation absolutely needed to get in the portal, period. Absolutely. You know, we follow these guys on Instagram and social media and Twitter and things like that, and we think, oh, you know, Everybody's great. Everybody's not great. And that's not just at Mississippi State. I mean, just think about, you know, the chances of you get 120 people in a room together and everybody loving each other and getting along. Pretty, pretty rare. Even at your own family reunion, that wouldn't be the case. But it's not always your school's fault when a guy transfers. There are some times that you've, you know, you, you have signed a guy that maybe perhaps is not the person you thought he was and it's better off for everybody. It's better for the program that they leave. And perhaps a fresh start will allow them – to reset their career. Just understand that. But now that Arnett is officially the coach, I think you're going to see a lot of this slow down as far as like, you know, these out here, these, these hustlers. Yeah, it's so funny to see these guys. Like you go to, you go to a camp or a seven-on-seven, there's some guy out there trying to dress young, right, trying to be cool, using all the, the current lingo, you know. It's, you know, it, it's disgusting, really. I mean, I am what I am. I do what I do. And I respect other people to do that. But, I mean, it's like when you're trying to basically exploit these kids you know, for your own gain. And, the, you know, listen, there, there are some guys you guys know. I mean, it's like I, I just I – mean, some of these people, like, they, they've ruined careers. Absolutely ruined kids. And do you, now, do you think they went and got them a job, though? They get them flushed out of college football – do they go on the job search with them? Do they go raise money to help them pay for their education? No. Nah. Of course, they're not, they're not useful to them anymore. Oh, we're family as long as you're signing something and I'm getting out of the deal. It's disgusting, man. It is. And you, you, you know, that's the thing. We talk about NCAA reform and things like that. that. That right there, that is something that has been a bane on the existence of college athletics forever. And there has not been enough done to limit or prohibit that behavior. You can say, but Steve, the NCAA has no jurisdiction over private citizens. You're absolutely correct. 
They do, however, have jurisdiction over the coaches that work with those people in concert. And so what I would do, you know, I have the answer to many of these problems. Nobody wants to hear them, but I have the answer. If I found out, if I, let's say that I'm the director of enforcement for the NCAA, and I found out, and I could prove, because, you know, that's the thing, I can ask those people for their phone records, right? And I'm a whiz with those. And I found out that these coaches are out here dealing with these street agents, and there's money exchange. I might not be able to get the street agent other than to disassociate them. I can get the coach. And I can make it where it's not worth it. All of a sudden, you leave a Power 5 program and you're coaching in JUCO or the NAIA for years at a time. Maybe you go coach high school, whatever. But you wouldn't be cashing these six- and seven-figure checks from one of my institutions again. Not anytime soon. I mean, we'll have a rehabilitation program for you. But if you're out here entertaining an audience with these street agents and using them to circumvent NCAA rules, then we're going to hold you accountable. And that's the thing. All of a sudden, you, know, you see these show causes out here that are they're crazy. I think you just put in a show, start putting a show cause on all these people and just tell them right out of the gate, it's going to be a show cause, and uh, we're also going to put it in place that uh, you're done at your current institution. You're finished. You're not going to be able to be under a show cause and stay there. You're finished. You will not be an outside recruiter. And then we'll give you an opportunity again down the road to be a coach. Maybe that first year you come back, you don't have anything to do with recruiting. Maybe you come in and you're a support staff, or maybe we're going to let you coach on the field. But there has got to be consequences for people that are ruining college football. There have to be. And, again, I've chased that rabbit trail for long enough. But, um, again, I think that you will see that the news of Arnett's hiring be a stabilizing factor in things for Mississippi State. Doesn't mean that everybody's going to stay. Maybe some guys leave after the spring. Maybe. But I'm glad to get this behind us because now people can't negatively recruit against us in this respect. And, again, Zach Arnett, a, uh, a brilliant guy. He was an academic All-American at New Mexico. He was a bit of an undersized linebacker, actually accepted a spot on the baseball team, and then ultimately walked out for football, made the team, earned a scholarship, and was a four-year contributor out there at Albuquerque at UNM. But I think Zach Arnett is a guy that always feels like he has something to prove. I like people like that. I don't like people that get comfortable. I like people that take it personal because I'm kind of like that. Always grinding, always looking for the next angle. You know, because I don't want to go back, right? I mean, I've worked very hard to get here. I don't want to go back. And that's why I think Zach Arnett, I think there is just something within him that drives him to win. And you look at the, the defense, how well they played at times this year. We had a couple games that you know, things didn't go the way we wanted to. And, and they, that's, that's competition, right? You don't win them all. And sometimes you win when you don't play well on defense. There are other times, like you look at the Egg Bowl, we absolutely dominated Ole Miss. Absolutely dominated them. Other than two drives in that game, they did absolutely nothing. And they were one of the most prolific offenses in the country. So Zach Arnett can get those guys ready to play, and his players enjoy playing for him. As I said on Wednesday show, when you have the respect of the locker room, you have everything. Because those people will follow you. When they respect you, they will listen to you. Zach Arnett's a guy that, uh, you know, works out himself. They won't be dogging workouts. If you've ever seen him in practice, his attention to detail is off the charts. I won't mention the player, but we had a guy in the secondary earlier this year, had a couple of good practices. Next thing you know, he has a big bust in, a, in uh, team drills, and Zach kind of gets on him. The player didn't respond. He just goes back out, does the rep again, makes the same mistake again. Zach gets on him. And then eventually the guy says, it's just so complicated, coach. And then Zach kind of loses it. He said, hey, listen, you know, if it, 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 it may be complicated. It shouldn't be at this point. You know, you've been here long enough to understand this. But he gotten his gotten some bass in his voice as he said this. But the player didn't quit. The player understood that Zach Arnett has his best interest and Mississippi State football's best interest at heart. He's not yelling to be yelling. He's not griping to gripe. He's not picking on you. The guy made a mistake, and Zach coached him hard. A week later, 
the same situation came up, the kid made the play. That's what good coaching does. And again, we've kind of handicapped coaches these days, you know, with this portal business. You know, now nowadays, you know, with the window set up, that you know, quitting in the middle of the season makes you look like a quitter. And then the thing that I go back to a lot too is like, why would you quit on your buddies? You know, the guys that you bled with and sweat with. You know, it's like, well, my position coach is picking on me. You know, how did you get this far in life with that thinner skin? I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of abuse, but I'm a fan of coaching. And I've been out there before with Mike Leach is out there, and he didn't like the, the, you know, the attitude and practice, didn't like the body language and practice, so he would just stop practice and everybody start over again. He'd have everybody come over there and do up-downs in front of him in a big circle until he got tired of watching them do it. There was an accountability piece with Leach. And I suspect you're going to see a big accountability piece with, with Zach Garnett. And Zach is going to make some mistakes. Zach's a first-time head coach. He is. He made some first some mistakes the first time DC. Like, and that's one of the things that's refreshing about Zach. It maybe makes him a little bit different than some other coaches. I remember asking him about zero coverage last year. It seemed like every time we ran zero coverage, you get a big play. And I asked him, why does that keep happening? And he goes, you know what? He said, that's on me. It's not on our players, it's on me. It was a bad call by me. I think that's one of the reasons that his players will run through a brick wall for him. Now, there were a couple of those times, too. I know it wasn't on Zach. You had a bust. And in real time, you see that. You had a bust in coverage, or you had somebody miss an assignment, or you had somebody loafing on a play, which is rare at Mississippi State, to be honest. And I saw how Zach interacted with the player after the play. So I know it wasn't a bad call. But instead, Zach is up there standing in the fire for his guys. It's a bad call by me. Now, that's not what he says in the film room, but that's what he says publicly. And I suspect kind of moving forward, that's what you're going to see when he addresses the entire team. The big question now is, what do we do for a play call on the offensive side? I, sus- I fully suspect we go outside the program. I do think there will be some changes on the offensive side of the football. Do we continue to run the full air raid? I, I, probably not. Maybe a more modified, more modern version of the air raid. But there will be some changes on the offensive side of the football. There will be. And you got to bring an offensive coordinator in. And you bring a coordinator in, he probably has a coach or two he wants to bring with him. You know, do we want to have two wide receiver coaches? I don't know. I don't know how Zach wants to structure it. But, again, I don't expect any changes between now and uh, in the bowl game. But I know that there are some people in staff I'd love to, be, to, to hear to their state because they love Starkville and they've done a good job here. But at the end of the day, Zach Arnett has to make the decisions that he feels – they're the best to put Mississippi State in a position to win. And so I support Zach. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrible way to have to get a job, right? But even if Mike Leach had decided to retire this year or next year, I think Zach Arnett would have been your head coach. Now, as I said on Wednesday's show, I wish we had the luxury of time to do a national search and just maybe see what other levels of interest there are out there, right? I mean, like, what if all of a sudden – you know, Cliff Kingsbury decides to leave Arizona. You don't think Cliff could coach the air raid, the modern version of the air raid, and start with Mississippi? Absolutely could. But we don't have the luxury of time. And so based on the information that we have at the time, this was absolutely the right decision. That's not to say it's going to be a smooth ride every day. It's not. Any of you that's ever had a new job or been promoted to give more responsibility, there is a learning curve. But I know this, I know Zach Arnett will give his absolute all for Mississippi State because that's who he is. That's how he's built. That's how we, what he's always done his entire life is go out there and compete at the highest level. And he demands excellence from his players. And let, let's not forget the fact. Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's be objective here. This was not the most talented defense that we've had in a while. They were much better as a unit. What's the old expression? You know, the sum is, you know, the total is greater than the sum of its parts. Somebody will correct me, I'm sure. They were better as a unit than perhaps they were as individuals. But we didn't have a dominant defensive lineman. We ended up having two very, very productive linebackers. And then Tyrus Weech, throw him in too. You know, he didn't fill up the stat column like those guys did, but that guy impacted the game, man. Linebackers were outstanding. 
Secondary got better. You got an All-American corner over there. But by and large, we expected this defensive front to be better than they were. And you still look at what we did and how we ended up the season. Can you begin to imagine what, what would this defense look like with like 2018 talent? What if you had Jeffrey Simmons, Montez Sweat, and Jonathan Abram playing in this defense? Not to mention, I think, a supporting cast. 2018 defense, one of the best defenses ever played in the history of Mississippi State football. But we have not had that typical, sure enough, shutdown defensive lineman at Mississippi State in a couple of years. Probably go back even further than that. You may have to go back to 18. Since we've had a defensive lineman that was so disruptive that he opened up the game for everybody else, and that is in no way suggesting that we didn't have some guys play really hard for us this year. I think Cam Young is going to make a lot of money. I think Jaden Crumbody could be that guy next year. But Arnett coached his tail off this year and had a good defense talent-wise and got a, got a really good result. I won't say great. Some games were great. But what's going to happen when Arnett gets a typical Mississippi State defensive front? When you've got NFL prospects up there kind of up and down the line at varying levels of, of experience. That kind of stuff excites me. But, again, this, the, the offensive coordinator hire is probably the most significant hire that, that Zach Arnett will ever make in his life. And I don't think you promote from within. You do for the bowl game. But I think you go outside the program and you get an OC outside the program, which will probably, again, lead to some more attrition. But it's a principles before personalities thing. We've got to do what's best for Mississippi State, not necessarily for you as an individual. Because while we love you, our mutual interest may not align down the stretch. Right now, we're family. You're in a very volatile you know, profession. And so there may be some guys that we all love to take jobs elsewhere. Or maybe Zach elects not to retain them. I mean, you simply never know. You know, it's, it's a new day in time. I wish none of this had ever happened. But it has, and we have to move forward. It's absolutely heartbreaking. But it is a business. This aspect of it is. And so now we attempt to kind of pick up the pieces and find a way to go beat Illinois. You, know, you may have noticed Ryan Walters has also left uh, Illinois. So that's a good thing, too. But, uh, again, I am absolutely on board with Zach Arnett. I am uh, optimistic because I believe that he has the raw materials to be excellent. And you look at his pedigree. I mean, this is a guy that played for and coached under Rocky Long, one of the greatest defensive coaches in the history of the college game. He was handpicked by Mike Leach. And it's so funny, too, when, when, when Leach hired Arnett, I remember all oh, this guy's never even called plays before. And then the, the, very, the very next six months, we had to fend off LSU and other schools from getting him. And, of course, we'd, John Cohen had the forethought to go ahead and sign him to an extension in the season. It gave him a pretty big buyout. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And I know I heard some feelings with these comments. I didn't care then. I care even less now. There were some people on the LSU media side that were trying to suggest, oh, that they're working on the buyout. Absolutely not. We were not working on the buyout. And if you know anything about John Cohen, John was not going to take anything less than every single cent owed to Mississippi State. It didn't matter that he was going, that there was an SEC West school involved or there had been Ohio State or whoever. The buyout is in there for a reason. We're not going to give you a reduction in the buyout. We want to retain the employee. But I remember our people losing their minds, thinking we're going to lose him to LSU. Well, you didn't even want him six months ago because he'd never called plays before. And then the next year, it's like, hey, well, you know, we took kind of a step back on defense. And then this year, we took a step forward. Zach Arnett is a brilliant defensive coach. And he hadn't had the full complement of the weapons that maybe some of his predecessors had on defense. Once he gets them, yeah, I think you're going to see some historic caliber defenses because I think the scheme is sound. I think Zach understands – when and how to send pressure, more so now than at any point in his career. Now he's got three years of experience as a play caller. Now he's your head coach. But, again, he's got to go out there and get an offensive coordinator because offensive production and, and proficiency is everything. We're going to play good defense. You know, we played great defense under Sylvester Croom, too. We just couldn't score, right? We don't want to go back to those days. We've got to have a dynamic offense. And if that means air raid, air raid plus, whatever, triple option, whatever it is, I don't think you go that route. Because we're not, you know, we haven't recruited or tooled for another scheme. There's got to be some elements of the air raid. But again, Zach will make those decisions. All right, time for today's top ten list. Brought to you as always by CloseWithBlair.com. We are going to do a, a regular top ten list today. 
Uh, Blair Chandler is my friend, your friend, a friend to everybody in need when it comes to mortgage issues. Many of you have like uh, thought, you know what, Steve, it's not going to work out for us. We're just going to rent forever and we're going to live in grandma's house or whatever. And, and, and you know you deserve better and maybe you haven't been treated better. Well, Blair Chandler can help you do that, help you change your life, help you get out of grandma's house, help you get a house of your own, something you can pass down to your children someday. We talk about generational wealth and things like that. You know, being a homeowner is one of the most important things you can ever have. Let Blair Chandler go to work for you. Maybe you need a second mortgage. Maybe you need a second residence. You know, Blair can help you with every bit of that. This is a guy that's been in the industry 21 years. Works at Fairway Mortgage, one of the greatest lending institutions in the country. But Blair gets things done. That's why the website's called closewithblair.com. We're closing your loan. And if Blair can't get it closed, it can't be closed, but he can put you on a path perhaps to get you in a better borrowing situation in the future. With several of our Boneyard listeners, close loans of Blair Chandler. You could be next. Give him a call or text today at 62344. Mention to him you heard about him on the Boneyard. He'll pay for your appraisal. It's about a $500 value. How cool is that? Be sure to check it out today. Closewithblair.com. All right, it's time to feel old, uh, you Generation Xers. It's time to feel old. 92 was a big year for me, big, big, big year for me. So, and it's a good round number, like it's 30 years ago. So in 1992, let me just think here for a second. So I got out of jail uh, July of 92, and then I met this really hot blonde on July 10th of 92. Our first date was August 10th. We got engaged October 7th, and uh, I picked up my one-year chip of sobriety, in that December. And so I guess I've been thinking about those things in hindsight. And I was thinking, you know, I remember us having some great music back then, but music was also in transition. You know, the eighties had kind of been dominated by the pop star and uh, rock music. In nineties, we had the grunge movement. And the truth of the matter is a lot of those bands didn't have a lot of traction on the radio. There were a few and there were some MTV stars, but, there weren't a lot of bands in grunge kind of tearing up the Billboard charts. And really, the grunge year was 91, part of 92. And there were a few bands that came out, and, and it lingered for a while. But in some respects, as impactful as grunge was, it was a very, very, very short time in music. It was a trend. And it didn't last very long. And what's interesting Speaking of trends, you know, the, uh, the bands of the Pacific Northwest were wearing their flannel shirts basically because they were broke and they were cheap and they were warm. And it began this fashion craze, and it kind of crossed over to hip-hop. And I was watching some videos of these songs today, and everybody's wearing the baggage of Bo Jeans and Timberlands, and I still do. I still do. And then there's these nice, incredibly well-insulated flannel shirts. So it's like flannel was like a fashion of necessity in the Pacific Northwest, and it became a national phenomenon. You had these incredibly nice-looking clothes, and then all of a sudden flannel shirts didn't get buttoned. They were kind of an overshirt over your T-shirt because everybody was baggy back then, everybody. The number one song 30 years ago this week is a cover. It's not on our list, but it's Whitney Houston's amazing cover from the Bodyguard soundtrack of Dolly Parton's classic hit, I Will Always Love You. It's an amazing song. It is. And Whitney's version, incredible. Both of them had huge hits with it. But it was one of those songs that uh, really kind of captured the moment. Now, music was changing. As I said before, we were starting to see a lot more crossover from R&B. Some rap, a lot of R&B. In the early 90s is when it kind of became okay to listen to hard rock and hard rap. I mean, there were a lot of people that were in the NWA and Public Enemy that were also in Anthrax and Metallica, bands like that. So all of a sudden it was okay. They started playing shows together. Things were changing. But there was a lot of R&B really kind of leaking its way from the R&B charts onto the Hot 100 and onto popular radio. And I think in many respects, 92 was kind of the arrival of hip-hop in the mainstream. All right, so here we go. My favorite 10 songs from the Billboard chart 30 years ago today, because I am from the 1900s. I'll live through this. 
Number 10, an alternative rock song, a band that I still like. I still listen to them occasionally. Um, it's Toad the Wet Sprocket. And their debut into our consciousness was a great song called All I Want. And uh, the second album, Dulcina, which, of course, is the girlfriend of uh, Don Quixote, that's the one for me. Um, I love that album, but All I Want was a great hit. Number nine, um, I, I, these number nine and number eight songs, I, I maybe could have had higher on the, on the list. But number nine is House of Pain's Jump Around. They still play that at college basketball games. 30 years later, it's a classic and iconic song. And it's really a one-hit wonder. Of course, uh, Everlast had a, a big hit off the uh, Whitey Ford Sings the Blues album with What It's Like, which is an amazing song. But Jump Around. Get out your seat and jump around. Number eight, from the movie Boomerang. We've talked about this song on the show before. It's an amazing song. And again, I probably should have had it higher on the list, but I kind of forgot about it. Because it was beginning, at this point in 92, it was beginning to wane. It was falling from the charts. But it's end of the road from Boys to Men. And as while I've loved that song, thankfully in my lifetime, I haven't had to, I haven't like had to feel that, right? I haven't had to sing that with any emotion. I love the harmonies on it, though. Boys to Men, amazing. Number seven, Many of you probably haven't thought about this band since the early 90s. My wife absolutely loved this song. Loved it. I had to go out and buy her a CD, and I was broke as the Ten Commandments. But I did. I went and bought her a CD. Only a couple good tracks on there, but uh, it's Love is on the Way from Saigon Kick. Video is really cool. Kind of subdued, but uh, again, the harmonies. And again, this is not really an alternative rock band. They didn't have the same tuning as maybe a band like Toad the Wet Sprocket or R.E.M. did. But this is kind of the last gasp of the 80s rock bands. Saigon Kick was a part of that. Number six, it's Bobby Brown. And I contend to you to this day, my friend Demi Brown disagrees with me. I think Don't Be Cruel is the best R&B album of my life. Bobby Brown's Don't Be Cruel is an amazing album. The follow-up... Not so much. Had some hits, not nearly as good. And it didn't hold up. But we're going with the song that got Bobby Brown banned from MTV. It's Humping Around by Bobby Brown, number six on your list today. I love the bass on this. It still hits. I still jam it in the car sometimes when I'm driving. Number five, this was kind of the infancy of her reign. It's kind of the queen of R&B. It's Mary J. Blige. And uh, it's, the song is Real Love. She still performs this one. But this is one of those songs, too, where it was a huge crossover hit that went from the R&B stations to the club to Top 40 Radio. It became a top 10 hit for Mary J. Blige, and it really kind of announced her on the scene is that hey, she has some staying power. She's not just somebody that some good songwriter picked out a song that fit her vocal range. Mary J. Blige is the real deal. Now, these last four I know are going to be somewhat controversial because the, many of these are one-hit wonders. In some respects. The band that I'm about to talk about now is uh, not a one-hit wonder, but uh, their first album was a smash hit that came out of nowhere. Second album was really good, and then things began to wane, and then sadly we lost Lisa Left Out Lopez. But it's TLC's What About Your Friends. That's your number four song today. And if you that Crazy Sexy Cool album is amazing. If you don't know it, go check it out. And that's the thing, too. Like, if there's first couple TLC albums... There's some deeper tracks on there that probably should have and could have been singles. All right, number three. Many of you may have forgot about this one. I love this song. I still listen to this song, too. Because you remember in the early 90s, your good friend and host was part of the, uh, the Southern dance scene. That's right. So you remember Snap broke through with the power, right? And everybody loved that song. They came back with Rhythm as a Dancer, which is amazing. And it was in the clubs. It was everywhere. Everybody loved this song. I remember seeing a shirt one time. I think I talked about this on the show. I, I should have bought it. And it was basically a prayer. And it said, Dear God, when it comes to the rhythm and the blues, give me the rhythm because rhythm is a dancer. And I was like, you know what? And that may not seem real profound today, but it did then. It did then. So Snaps, Rhythm as a Dancer, number three on your list. Number two, a one-hit wonder if there ever was one, but, man, what a hit it was. I remember then there was there is a there is a track that is the a cappella version, which was the hit, and then there is one that actually has a backing track. I, I can't listen to the one with a track. I, I just can't. I can't do it because to me the beauty in this song, 
are these four young men. I believe they were from uh, from Moorhead College. I think that's right. I think it's right. From they were from HBCU. It's the band Shy, and the song is "If I Ever Fall in Love." That song is so incredibly heartfelt and so incredibly well performed. You begin to ask yourself, did they just run out of songwriters? Because these guys are amazingly talented. That, I get chills even thinking about it now. That song, when they started playing that on the radio, it was unlike anything else. But I think that, in many respects, begin again, kind of ushered in this new era of R&B on the radio, on the top 40 charts. Because all people are like, hey, well, wait a minute. I've never heard something like this. And then all of a sudden, there's the rise of Boys to Men, and there's Jodeci. And like they, they all kind of arrived together. Uh, Shadis didn't have any staying power. But if I ever fall in love, I've told Roy to put the acapella version on here because it's absolute mastery. I absolutely love the song, the way it's performed. If you have ever loved anybody, if that song doesn't do something to you, then you know, maybe it's time to reevaluate some things. Number one, though, in 92, you could not go anywhere without hearing this song. Again, a one hit wonder. An amazing song. It's Rex and Effects Rump Shaker. And why is that number one? It's because all I want to do is boom, zoom, 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 and a boom, boom. That's me. Love that song. Teddy Riley was a part of that. It was absolutely amazing. And it was so fun, like that fall when that song was everywhere. Because everybody loved it. Like, like you'd pull up at a red light and people would be playing a song. You go to the mall, it's, they're playing it at Sound Shop. You turn on the radio, they're playing it. You go, go home, watch TV. It was everywhere. The video was fine. Of course, it was a low-budget thing because nobody knew how it was going to go, but anything Teddy Riley's involved in is usually very good. But number one, the number one song to me, Rump Shaker from Rex and Effect. And some of you have not thought about that song in forever, and you're going to be jammered on your way home today. Very, very glad that you will. That's your top ten list for today. If you have ideas for the top ten list, reach out and let us know. best way to do that is hit up Roy on Twitter at dogmatic67. You can also find our great list on Spotify on the same handle, Dogmatic, D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. And let us know. You know, again, I, I didn't, this week has been a different week. And I wanted to kind of get back to what we do. And uh, so, I, so with that, I was thinking about, you know, me 30 years ago, what I was doing, kind of creating a new life for myself. And I said, you know what, let's go back to the soundtrack of that time. But every one of these songs, in some respects, means something to me. And that's the beautiful thing about music, right? They're just... There are songs maybe you don't hear for even decades at a time, and you put them back on, it's like the greatest time machine in the world. You put it back on, you remember where you were, who you were with, who you loved, right? All those things, it just brings it all back. It's amazing how, how music can take you anywhere you want to go. And I'm so glad we can share that here on the show. That's your top ten list for today. It's always brought to you by CloseBlair.com. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Bookmart. You guys should know Campus Bookmart well by now. If you don't, it's time to familiarize yourself with their merchandise. The greatest selection of Mississippi State merch anywhere in the known universe. A lot of people make that claim. They back it up. Bully Shop has been completely renovated. It's all on the first floor now. You go by and see all of the latest in Mississippi State fashions. If you can't make it to town, let me encourage you. Visit them on the World Wide Web, courtesy of Al Gore's Internet at campusbookmark.net and by being a loyal boneyard listener we'll give you a phrase that pays and that is bsr which stands for beautiful steve robertson that gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks any order less than 75 bucks absolutely incomplete be sure to check them out today in campusbookmark.net promo code bsr all right, don't look now, but the Mississippi State men's basketball team is 10-0. and 0. We did not have a great showing against Jackson State in the Coliseum, but uh, we get out of there with a dub, and that's what, that's what matters most. You get the win, you move on. It was not a great night. They were 1-8. They're now 1-9. Bulldogs 10 and 0. We got their best effort. There's no doubt about it. DJ Jeffries led the way with 15 points for your Bulldogs. Four Bulldogs in double figures that night. Tolu Smith, Eric Reed uh, Jr., and Keyshawn Murphy. Eric Reed with three huge threes. And that was right when it felt like Jackson State was beginning to control the flow of the game. So big night, 8 of 26 as a team. We have got to shoot the basketball better. We have got to shoot better. Now defensively, not many teams have uh, surpassed 55 points. Jackson State gets 59. So maybe it's one of those things where you learn a big lesson without taking the loss. 
3,206 paid to see it. All proceeds go towards the Bulldog Initiative. But Mississippi State is a team uh, 46.9% from the field. Shot much better in the second half. The first half, just over 40%. We shot nearly 55% there in the second half. Did a much better job. And that was the difference in the game. 26 points in the paint, 21 off turnovers, 7 second chance points, 24 on the fast break, probably none bigger than that big heave from DJ late in the game. Justice State was pulling away. And, again, that's what good teams do. They close. And how many times in the, over the course of the last couple years we get to those final four minutes and we can't close? And, again, that goes down to coaching. That absolutely goes down to coaching. Right at the four-minute mark, State hits a three-point basket. Excuse me. State gives up a three-point basket to start Volt native Colty Young to make it a four-point game with four minutes to play. It is 60 to 56, and from there, State took control, outscored them with nine to three down the stretch to win the ball game by 10. And their free throw late was just kind of, you know, it was kind of just charity in many respects. But uh, good job by State, good job by the team to win a game when we didn't play well. With all the excitement, we did not recap the Minnesota win. State handles that very easily, wins by 18 points, makes it a 69-51 game. So, again, you're 10-0 and 0 now. Now, this Saturday, last game in the hump here for uh, about 11 days, it is Christmas at the hump. The first 500 fans will get a free ornament. And if it's free, it's me. Maybe you agree. You also can get your picture made with Santa Claus. Bring the kids, get an ornament for the tree, get the picture made, and come out and support the Bulldogs this Saturday, 2 p.m. against Nichols. Should be a nice game. It will be broadcast on the SEC uh, network. You know, the Colonels down there in Thibodeau have had some good athletes over the years. They have. But it should be a game that we can out-athlete them. I think everybody would probably agree with that. Should be a chance for us to go 11-0. They are 5-5 five and five on the year. Kind of look at the schedule here. They got off to a rough start. They open up on the road at Arizona. They get drilled 117-75. They lose at Wyoming 79-68. They cancel a home game against Carver College. Not sure of the story there. And then they drop to BYU on the road. So the first three games of the year, road games, and they're 0-3. Since that time, obviously 5-2. and two. They beat Jarvis Christian. It looks like Jarvis is the only one that showed up as they win 97-52. They lose out in Vegas to UC Irvine and bounce back and beat San Diego in a barn burner of a game, 72-70. They beat Champion Christian. I don't know what's happening here with these Christian schools, but uh, they are no match for the Colonels. They destroy Champion Christian 115-50. They go on the road, lose at Texas Tech, 78-71. You know, the Texas Tech team uh, last year was outstanding. They beat Russ College, and then they beat Southeastern Louisiana 88-73. So not a marquee win on the schedule. When they have played Power 5 competition, it is not going well. So State should be able to handle this game. We've got to go out there and shoot the basketball. There's no question about that. But um, leading scorer for them is uh, Latrell Jones. He's averaging just under 16 points a game, a 6'5", 180-pound guard, a fifth-year senior from Archbishop Shaw, they're out of New Orleans. That's the uh, same high school that gave us uh, not not. It, it's Ryan. I can't remember Ryan's name. I apologize for that. Uh, I thought I had it all figured out, but I don't. Uh, but uh, just three guys scored in double figures for them: Caleb Huffman and uh, Micah Thomas. But uh, again, should be a game that State should handle. That'll be the last home game again for eleven days, and then on December twentieth, which is Tuesday. That afternoon, we'll be in Lincoln, Nebraska to take on Drake. It's called the Battle in the Vault. That'll be on an outfit called Baller TV, which probably means probably means you got to download an app somewhere, uh, or perhaps uh, you know watch uh, on your on your tablet, your device. But looking at the Drake uh, Bulldogs here, they have had uh, an interesting year to say the least. If I can find this dead gum schedule here, it's incredible how that works sometimes. Like, you know, some websites are still very antiquated. This is one of them. But uh, Drake, 8-2 and two on the year. 8-2. and two. 
you look at their schedule too, they have not played the greatest of competition. But, uh, you know, they knocked down Wofford. Remember, Wofford gave us all we wanted and then some here a couple of years ago in the Humphrey Coliseum. They beat those guys 80-72. Uh, they, they do that. We talked about Wyoming. They were able to beat Wyoming out there in the St. Thomas Virgin Islands. Take down Louisiana. They lose at Indiana State. That's the home of uh, Larry Bird. And then they've lost their most recent game at Richmond. They will play this Saturday at St. Louis. So, again, a worthy opponent, to say the least. So, State should be able to get through Nichols without much issue. And then you'll have a Drake team that is eager for a net win. We will get their best effort. I don't think there's any question. And then we get into SEC play. That'll round out non-conference play. And then we will host Alabama December 28th. It's a Wednesday. I will be in Orlando, Florida. Hopefully you'll be in the Humphrey Coliseum. I'll be in Orlando getting ready to go to the Bahamas. But um, it'll be a big game. And uh, we'll certainly find a way to watch that game. Uh, while we're out there. Of course, that'll be an SEC network game. This Alabama team is very, very good. This Mississippi State team is good. And we get them at our place. That'd be a huge win early on. And again, the, the schedule early on for State is not advantageous. You get Alabama at home and you go to Knoxville, Tennessee to take on the Volunteers. Uh, you know what Rick Barnes and those guys are going to bring a good effort. And then we host Ole Miss here. If you can find a way to split those first two games and get Ole Miss here at our place, could be a capacity crowd. And they're also encouraging fans to wear maroon that day. That's deck the hump in maroon and catch the diaper derby at halftime. Exciting times. But uh, Chris Jans, his staff, doing a remarkable job so far. And you start looking at this, it's like, hey, if you can find a way to win, I think you can win these last two non-conference games. But let's say you're 11-1 and one headed into conference play and you find a way to go 500 in the league, you got a really good chance to be a good postseason team somewhere. And at this point, we don't know. We don't know how good this league is. We don't know. But I do think that Chris Jans and his staff have scheduled well. They've given themselves an opportunity to play some games at home to get their legs under them. But they've also, of course, with wins over Marquette and Utah, uh, you'll ride the the net result of that, no pun intended, uh, the rest of the season. So good effort so far from the men's side. Uh, The women's side, we talked about them too. You know, these ladies have a chance too because they had a very ambitious schedule. To finish non-conference play, uh, really on a streak here, nine and two now, and they've won four in a row. That dates back, of course, to that loss in San Juan, Puerto Rico, against Nebraska. You've knocked off Louisiana Monroe, you've knocked off Granville, you've blasted Texas A&M Commerce, and just last night, our own Robbie Falk was there to cover uh, a 72-47 victory over Florida A&M. So now you get ready to play on Monday down in Tampa, Florida against Old Dominion. This also will be on Baller TV. Perhaps that is worth your investment. If it is a pay-per-view app, you're going to have an opportunity to see three games involving Mississippi State sports on Baller TV uh, here over the course of the next few days. That Suncoast Challenge, State will play Old Dominion and then New Mexico out in Tampa, and both of those games will be on Baller TV. So be considering that as you kind of move forward. That will round out the non-conference schedule. And, again, you look at these games, and they're on a neutral floor, and you begin to realize, you know, these ladies could end up in non-conference with an 11-2 and two mark. It is certainly doable, absolutely doable. Now, nobody invites, uh, you know, really bad teams to these tournaments. More times than not, you know, you're, you're going to get a team that's at least good. They may not be great but you're going to get a team that obviously can play some ball. Old Dominion is 8-3 and three this year, and they've won six in a row. And prior to them taking on us, they'll have uh, some time to rest. They played last Sunday and then have not played this week, will not play again until they get down to Tampa to take on uh, the Bulldogs. And they also will play uh, New Mexico on Tuesday. And speaking of New Mexico – they're a team, too, that has had some level of success here in recent years. They are 6-4 and four this year, and they also uh, have one game before they, uh, they hit the road here. I guess they're done, actually. Yeah, they're off this week, too. So that's kind of how things stand. Everybody's getting ready to travel into Tampa. So they have won uh, two in a row themselves. They beat Abilene Christian and New Mexico State uh, in Albuquerque. So the Lobos kind of figuring some things out. But, again, these are winnable games for us. But, again, both on the men's and the women's side, with Drake and with Old Dominion, you have teams that you're going to have to bring your best effort or you will get beat. 
So some competitive basketball in our future here. And, again, I encourage you, as always, get out and go see them, especially some of you Bulldogs that live uh, kind of out and about, right? If you are out of state and you don't get a chance to get back very often, you start thinking about if you live in the West Florida area, you've got a chance to go watch the ladies play December 19th and 21st and then turn around, you know, about two weeks later and see the Bulldogs play uh, in the ReliQuest Bowl. If you haven't bought your tickets, I'm encouraged you to do so. I am told that ticket sales have picked up this week. I've also read on other SEC and Southern football message boards that there are some Florida and Florida State fans that plan to go to the game to support Mississippi State in honor of Mike Leach. So you're going to have a little local traffic there as well, people that perhaps maybe like Florida fans maybe don't want to go to Vegas to see a 6-16 and play. So you know what? I'm going to go support Mike Leach. I'm sure there'll be a nice ceremony there, and they can celebrate on a pirate ship with us. But we do expect there to be a good crowd. Will it be a capacity crowd, a sellout crowd? Probably not. But I suspect it'll be a better crowd than we had when we went down there in 2018. Because, again, yeah, when you when you lose the egg bowl, you don't sell bowl tickets. That's just how Mississippi State people are. It's like we, we get in our feelings a little bit, and it's like, you know what? No regular season is complete without a win over Ole Miss, and we lose even though we felt like we had uh, – I guess we did win in 18, but um, – but we didn't bring a good crowd down to the Outback Bowl. And there's all this, this talk out there about how we're just not a good traveling team. In some respects, it may be the case. But I suspect you're going to see some really good crowd numbers down at the Outback Bowl. And let's take a quick look while we're here together and uh, look at some of these crowds they've had over the years out in Tampa. You know, we, we hold some attendance records, but um, far be it. For us back in 18, but uh, let's look at attendance here. If I can find it. Yeah, here we go. All right, so in recent years, I get so tired of Wikipedia begging me for money. Maybe you guys feel differently. Uh, so, of course, uh, last year, 46,577. Ole Miss and Indiana played during the COVID year, just 11,000. That's not an indictment on Ole Miss or Indiana. It's just the reality of reduced attendance. But uh, more times than not, it's around 50 so thousand. You know, back in the late 2000s, they're packing in 60,000 plus. But uh, this ball game, some of it's because of matchups, but uh, they have not had a crowd of 60,000 plus since 2011. And that was Florida versus Penn State. And of course, they benefit from having Florida fans uh, come to the game. And that was their first crowd of 60,000 plus since 2008 when Tennessee and Wisconsin played. And if memory serves me correct, you know, Tennessee. He'd only been there, I think, three or four times. So it's a bit of a novelty thing. But, uh, again, a chance for us to go down there and have a good crowd. My hope is that you will go. I will not be there. Mike Nemeth, uh, our photographer, Mansell Gary, and Dave Murray all approved for media credentials this week. So we will staff the game. And you can follow our coverage over at jeanspage.com. But how great would it be for us to have a crowd of 60,000 plus? I think the Outback Bowl would love that too. But uh, at the end of the day, it's about our players and our coaches and getting supporting the maroon and white and honoring Mike Leach. I go back to that uh, Gator Bowl we had, you know, after 17, you know, where we'd lost Nick Fitzgerald, we'd lost Dan Moe, and, and we didn't have a great crowd down at the Gator Bowl. But all of you guys that went and your families uh, probably deserve some Bulldog Club points because you went down there and you really cheered our team on to victory. It was an outstanding performance. The game meant an awful lot to a lot of people. Of course, our friend DJ Looney was on that staff. God rest his soul. And I remember talking to him that week how angry he was, how disappointed he was. Dan didn't take him to Florida. He wanted to stay on at Mississippi State. That wasn't going to be an option for him. And uh, he said, you know what, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to coach these kids as hard as I can for my alma mater because I love Mississippi State. And one of the most endearing images of that game is when it went final, seeing DJ run on the field with his fist held high because we had beaten Lamar Jackson, the Heisman Trophy winner, and, uh, and won a game that uh, many people didn't give us much of a chance to win. And so big things can happen, and I think you want to be there to be a part of it. But uh, I understand it's some sacrifice, especially right after the holidays. But if you're on the fence about going, let me encourage you to go. A friend of mine said he bought some tickets yesterday. They needed five in one section, and then they couldn't get five together. So they're kind of scattered among the sections. So, again, you're going to have some people – uh, that buy tickets that may not be Mississippi State fans that will be Bulldogs for a day. I also had a, a friend that shared that they had bought some club-level seats and tried to go back yesterday to buy some more and were told that all the club-level seats were sold out. So that's a good sign. 
But uh, I hope we get a huge crowd there. And uh, I, I know the Outback Bowl folks will do a great job there. The Rely Quest Bowl will do a good job there at Raymond James Stadium putting on a great event. I know we had a blast when we went down there uh, in 18. It was hot. It was. The weather wasn't great. It, it didn't feel like um, it didn't feel like winter. And the thing that I remember, too, in that game, too, if you recall, is our defense would not let Iowa do anything. And then we got flagged for an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty. And the next thing you know, like everything changed. If we just walk off the field there, we're probably having a different discussion today about that experience. We let them back in the ball game. And uh, we just simply couldn't get things figured out on offense. And that's one of the things that plagued us all year. Uh, but I think about this bowl game, I'm curious to see how Will Rogers and the offense will respond without Mike Leach calling plays. You know, will they let will they give Will more autonomy? I don't know. I, I don't know. And, you know, basically Leach called formations and then, you know, there was a sight read by Will. But I have a lot of confidence in Will Rogers. And I know what Mike Leach means to Will Rogers. And so Will will be ready to go. The main thing what we're going to have to do with Will – is to make sure he doesn't get too amped up and try to go score 50 points on the first drive, right? Let's just kind of let things come to us. But uh, I'm excited about the ball game, and, of course, I will not be there. I will be with my family, and uh, I look forward to watching the game with my family. I submit to you, uh, this may be the only time we have ever watched a game on TV together as a family. And then you say, well, Steve, how could that be? Well, it's usually because I'm on press row or I'm on the sidelines, you know, or we're scattered around the country or whatever. But uh, we will be together on a cruise ship watching the Bulldogs. And uh, I'll be happy to be with them. But there will be a part of my heart that will be with all of you in Tampa. And that's one of the reasons that I, I, I just absolutely have to go to the memorial service on Tuesday. And, and there's a part of me I wish I could just kind of leave now and begin my holiday break. But yeah, I feel like I owe it to Mike Leach and uh, I really owe it to myself to be able to go to, to pay my final respects to Mike Leach. But, um, you know, the, the ReliQuest Bowl will cap the Mike Leach file. And how wonderful would it be uh, to win that game and then have a nine-win season? I've shared with you guys before, we have won nine games or more in a season only eight times in our history. So we're talking about, as with warts and all, <laughs> this being one of the greatest seasons in the history of Mississippi State football, one of the top ten seasons of all time, if you can win this bowl game. You'd have the Golden Egg Trophy. You'd have the Rely Quest Bowl Trophy. Pretty significant. At the end of the day, you judge seasons on their entirety and the totality of the season. And so you begin to work through all that and you begin to realize, you know, hey, you you go eight and four, you get the egg back, you win a Florida bowl game and end up nine and four and ranked in the top 25 and, and potentially in the top, uh, you know, 15 if, if, the, if the numbers fall just right. But you feel like certainly state wins that ball game, you end the year as a ranked team. And that hadn't happened too many times either. And so I share that, again, to maybe encourage you to understand you could be the difference. You could absolutely be the difference in the ballgame. And uh, those young people need you to be there. They do. And I think nothing would speak greater than Miss of Mississippi State's fandom than for us to have a great crowd uh, at that historic venue uh, to close out the Mike Leach era. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by our friends at Portico. If you are considering moving to the greater Starkville area, there is no better place than Portico. Very easy to get to. Turn off 82 on a 12 like going to campus. Very first rights, Pat Station Road. Go through the four-way stop. There's Portico. And that's the thing, too. When you got to get out and go, when you got to get out and get on the road, maybe you got work or you got to go see grandma, whatever, very easy access to all the major highways that go through Starkville. Very easy. You can start with a two-bedroom, two-bath home, go all the way up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home, and if you need a custom build, they can help you with that. Many of you guys are a little bit extra, right? They can be extra right along with you. Give our friend Brooks Bryan a call today at 601-416-8075. Again, that's 601-416-8075. If I was moving to Starkville now, it's where I'd move. I'd love to be that close to campus, but again, you're kind of tucked away in a nice little neighborhood there, so you're not like right there on 82. Very, very, very important to understand that. But, uh, again, next time you're in town, give yourself a self-guided tour. And if you're looking to re relocate and your real estate agent hasn't mentioned Portico, maybe it's time you ask why. Best place to live in Starkville proper, without a doubt, is Portico. Give Brooks a call today. You'll be glad you did. All right, let's talk a little recruiting. You know, final recruiting weekend before the December signing period opens up, and we have had so many things going on. Maybe we haven't really committed enough time and effort to this. Thankfully, our coaches have. 
It has been a very good week on the recruiting trail for Mississippi State. Last weekend, you know, we had nine visitors in, and uh, we have picked up a commitment from a couple of those visitors. Uh, we've, you know, I guess back-to-back days here. We got uh, Radarius Jones, Radar from LSU, and then Kamari Rogers from Miami. Mississippi State recruited both of these players out of high school. They were four stars out of high school. They're four stars out of the portal. Now, when you begin to kind of pair all this stuff up together, you got to figure some things out. But, um, you know, I, I don't fully understand all the transfer rank and all that kind of stuff. I think it skews too much for the number of players rather than the quality of those players. But Darcel McBath doing work this week, again, gets those two corners out of the portal. And just last night, one of our visitors from this past weekend, Luke Evans from Chaminade Madonna Prep out of Hollywood, Florida, former Cincinnati commitment is now a Bulldog, an 88.3 ranking. I haven't watched his film yet. We'll we'll work on that some this weekend. But, uh, you know, decent offer list, 23 offers. Let's run down some of these for you just so you kind of know. Of course, Cincinnati, Akron, Arkansas, Arkansas State, Boston College, Duke, Eastern Kentucky, Florida Atlantic, Georgia, Indiana, Iowa State, Kentucky, Maryland, North Carolina, Penn State, Princeton, Purdue, Rutgers, Temple, Texas A&M, South Florida, Wake Forest. So a lot of options to choose from when he comes to Mississippi State. And, again, this is another long, lean corner, kind of in the same vein as Martin Emerson, DeCamerion Richardson, Emmanuel Forbes. That's what we're looking for. Guys that can run, guys with a good catch radius. And all of a sudden, you kind of quietly have put together a really good corners class. we got to go get us at portal safety. And maybe that's – after the December signing period, because those guys don't have to sign an NLI, an NIL, excuse me. No, it is NLI, National Letter of Intent. But you have quietly put together a very, very good cornerbacks class. I mean, this is an outstanding group. Bryce Pollock out of Snellville, Georgia, an outstanding player, former pick commitment. We just talked about Luke Evans. You got Jalen uh, Abram, who I think could grow into a safety. We'll see. And then Kelly Jones is listed as a safety, but he'll play corner. I've said that from the beginning. Nobody, nobody wanted to believe me. He is thinly framed. He's not going to add the mass to be a strong safety. That's not to say he couldn't play free. But he's going to start out in the Darcel McBass room. And then you throw in Kamari Rogers and, and Radar Jones. So you've got some stopgap guys that can come in and play while these younger guys develop. Now, Kamari will have four years of eligibility. He redshirted this year at Miami. Now he's headed back. But you begin to look at this. This is an excellent defensive back class. you got to get an impact safety, though, out of the portal, and you got to get Isaac Smith. Now, Isaac Smith's supposed to visit OSU this weekend. We'll see how things go. He has spent a lot of time on his campus. I do believe it's between State and OSU. I still believe that State leads. Now, a lot could change between now and Sunday visit to LSU. My hope is they drive all the way down there and they realize how far it is. It's a lengthy drive. It is. But the reality of it is LSU is a great program. We're not going to win because of uh, MapQuest or the GPS. Going to have to out-recruit those guys. But uh, I still feel good about where things stand today. We'll see. Now, we've got official visitors coming in this weekend. And um, let me dial that up for you, too. Now, last weekend, the talk was there would be probably a dozen or more, as many as two dozen visitors this weekend. But in light of what's happened at Mississippi State, they have scaled that back, especially with some of the portal guys. But, um, you know, we'll see how things kind of progress uh, here in the weeks to come because we'll have the opportunity to host visitors again in January. Now, the, the issue becomes then with transfer guys, you want to get them in and get them, get them, do, get them good you know, to get them all handled and get them enrolled sooner rather than later. So you may have some guys commit and sign to state and then not take an official visit because they won't need it. So let me look at your visitors for this week. I think it's about a half dozen. I looked at this earlier, kind of in anticipation uh, for today's show. But, um, you know, well, it's not a huge weekend, maybe perhaps the way we had intended, but I think, too, now that you've got these transfer corners, I think you begin to realize that this class is filling up. You've got, what, 24 guys now committed towards this class? And that's something to kind of be, be mindful of that, too, you know, is that 
you've got to be, have all this stuff handled and be under the 85. There is no 25 limit, but there is a group, obviously, that uh, you, know, you may need you may need some more attrition. And I think that's probably the reality for Mississippi State. And the reality of this is that uh, you probably need some more room because you've got some guys perhaps that aren't going to make a contribution. So that's an important part of this thing too. You know, so you, you're going to see some guys hit the portal after the bowl game and certainly after the spring. I don't think it'll be any names of note. What I mean by that is, you know, guys on the two deep. But uh, as it stands today, we, we're expecting uh, Creed Whitmore, Whitmore, excuse me, uh, and his brother to be here. Uh, of course, now that Mississippi State has made a, officially made a coaching change, you can bring some guys back officially if you choose to. That doesn't mean they come and spend the whole weekend, but there may be some guys who just kind of come back and you can feed them and that sort of stuff. Uh, Gabe Moore from Louisville High School will be here. Miami transfer, Kamari Rogers, of course, who is now committed to state. Uh, Florida transfer receiver and the brother of Creed Whittemore, Trent Whittemore, will also be here. And Iowa receiver transfer prospect, Arlen Bryce. May have had one late. We'll see. But uh, Ty Jones, of course, uh, longtime Mississippi State commitment. He'll take his visit in January. Nothing wrong there. As Paul Jones reported earlier today, he is uh, going through a shoulder procedure. But I don't anticipate a lot of commitments this weekend. Well, because half of your visitors this weekend already committed. Now, Trent Whittemore, I could see him announce his decision to transfer to Mississippi State. And he said, but Steve, will we take two wide receiver transfers? We absolutely would. And I think if Arlen Bruce wants to come, do you take him? Certainly. Good bloodlines there. So three of the five guys that are visiting this weekend are already committed. There is a possibility you get the other two. And then, of course, that, that brings your, uh, your, your commitment, total number of commitments up to, what, uh, 26? You see, you got 22 right now. Maybe I'm wrong. You've got 24 right now. 22 plus the two transfers. So you got 24 guys in the class right now. And as it stands, it appears that State is going to hang on to everybody, which says a lot about your assistant coaches because there were a lot of people out there trying to put negative thoughts on these guys' heads and say, hey, you need to consider doing this, maybe wait and sign in February, give yourself a chance for Mississippi State to figure these things out. Well, then State announces the promotion of Zach Arnett. And so that removes the possibility of the negative recruiting against Mississippi State in that respect. And so, again, I think that's been, that decision was the right decision to make, and I think it's kind of stabilized the recruiting cycle for Mississippi State. Uh, Kelly Jones initially was expected to visit Ole Miss this weekend. As of now, that visit has been canceled. There is discussion that he and his family may be back in Starkville this weekend to spend some time with the staff. Uh, I know that Kelly is very close with Darcel McBath. McBath, of course, coached and played for Mike Leach. I think you're going to see some players on campus this weekend and prospects on campus this weekend just to come kind of be around each other and kind of be around your players. I uh, shared earlier on Gene's page today, I've heard, I haven't confirmed with Joseph himself, but I've heard that LSU has some interest in Joseph Head, but in the end, that things will be okay. Um, I like the class. Now, I can't sit here and say I'm in love with the class, but I could be. I could be convinced to love this class if it closes the right way. You get Isaac Smith, I'm getting really, really excited about this class. You go get Caleb Bryant, I feel even better about the class. I think Isaac Smith is the headliner. I think Caleb Bryant is a bit of a developmental guy, but I think that's a guy that could develop Mississippi State and have a good career. Both of those guys, too, very highly ranked. And so that helps kind of what you're looking at as you kind of move forward because State right now ranked 28th in the composite. We felt like this had the potential to be a top 30 class, would need some help to get in the top 25. You get Bryant and you get, um, and you get Isaac Smith, and all of a sudden you start feeling really good about the ranking of the class. And at the end of the day, rankings matter. It's not the only thing that matters, but it matters. I mean, and, again, I've been in this industry a long time, and I can tell you there are some people out there that are offer counters. And so automatically, if Alabama takes a player or offers a kid, then the kid's going to get elevated in the ranking. Now, some of that just kind of stands to reason, right? Nick Saban, arguably the greatest college coach in the history of, of the game. So if he wants a kid, chances are the kid's pretty good. But they have taken some kids in the past that the film did not match the offer. And then ultimately those kids end up in the portal. And I just want to sit back and say, I told you so. 
I mean, there are some kids Alabama's taken a chance on that hadn't panned out, and, of course, they've been artificially ranked because of their link to Alabama. Then all of a sudden, oh, let's go get that guy. He was a four-star. Well, he was a four-star really because he went to Alabama, not the other way around. It's important to understand that. You know, we've seen it ourselves, right? You go out and get Tyrell Shavers. He was a guy that was highly re- recruited and had little production. Came here, had a big game against LSU, and the next thing you know, he's out of the program. You know, uh, those are things you think about, too. You know, there's a reason, guys, again, there's a reason guys are in the portal. It's not always negative, but there is a reason people are in the portal. Sometimes it's because, you know, they've gotten sideways with the staff. You know, sometimes they haven't picked up the offense. Maybe they haven't put out enough. And so there is some risk reward in the portal. Not, not everybody's going to be Joe Burrow. Not everybody's going to be Macap Hulk. You look at Randy Charlton. I mean, Randy was a good player for us and will, has kind of etched his name in Egg Bowl lore forever and a day because of a very heads-up play where he batted down a two-point conversion. But, you know, if we can get that caliber of player at the portal, we'd be a fool not to go do it. You get a good, steady, two-deep ride at the portal, you've done well because that's what you're trying to do is you build depth at the portal. You don't always go out there and find a superstar player. And that's when you look at Radar and you look at Kamari. Of course, Kamari just has the one year. Radar has been there for three years, and he was suspended this year reportedly for an academic issue. So hopefully he's back on track now. And you, know, you have to be in good academic standing to transfer unless you're going to junior college. So it would appear that he is. But neither of these guys have much in the way of college production. And so that's the thing you begin to ask yourself. Okay, if it didn't work out at LSU, what makes you think it'll work out here? Sometimes a change of scenery is good. And sometimes kind of being in a situation where you have to look at other options kind of humbles you a little bit. You begin to think to yourself, I need to put out a little bit more. If I have aspirations of going to the National Football League, I've only got a year or two to get this right. And some guys are in the portal just because they're just not as talented as people expect them to be. They just haven't developed. But we're going to have to go get some guys in the portal. I don't think it'll be near like it was last year. But you're still chasing a kicker. Uh, Co from Cincinnati appears to be a guy that we feel very, very, very good about. Visited last weekend. There's Gunnar Bredden, an offensive lineman from Western Kentucky. Could take him, you know. And that's one of the things, too, I think about with these offensive line recruits. It's like, you know, Mason Miller is here. You know, I, I don't know what Zach Arnett has told the returning offensive staff. Again, he, he may completely change the scheme. I don't know. But you've got recruiting relationships. Your coaches have been on the road. And so there are going to be some guys like Gunnar Britton. He's only got one year to get this right. He's built a relationship with Mason Miller. How would he feel like if Mason Miller wasn't retained? You know, would he ask out of a, a national letter of intent? I don't, I don't know. And so that's, that's kind of the labyrinth that Zach Arnett has to walk right now. You've got to do what's right for recruiting, but really you've got to do what's right long term. And you've got to believe in yourself. And, and certainly Zach has no, uh, no problem with that. But the, the reality of it is, is signing day is Wednesday. Wednesday, and I'll probably be in a hotel room somewhere in uh, West Oklahoma kind of going over this with you guys, right? I won't be at the press conference, but um, yeah, I'll be headed west. But uh, it's interesting how it all kind of unfolds and develops. It's almost kind of snuck up on us, just like Christmas. It's like, guys, we're nine days from Christmas. Did you realize that? It's a week from Sunday. Have you done your shopping yet? Many people haven't. I have. I'm done. I'm completely done. I might just pick up a couple of things my way out west. But uh, the, the, the point of the matter is, with all that we have had go on this year, it is incredible to, to think about where we are, that the year is almost over. You know, I thought about this earlier today, too. And uh, one of you guys, I think, posted it on Gene's page. You know, we had uh, Dave Nickel passed away during baseball season. You know, David left us and gone to USC and uh, was diagnosed with cancer. It was a very aggressive form of cancer, and, and ultimately he didn't survive. And our staff had to go out there and, and pay their respects to their friend. And it wasn't too terribly long ago we lost Sam Westmoreland. And, again, you know, your staff, your, your team, your players are dealing with tragedy again. And then you lose the Pirate. It has been an incredible year of adversity. And I don't mean from an injury standpoint. I don't mean from a scandal standpoint. I mean a life and death standpoint. It has just been this dark cloud in many respects. It's kind of hovered over us. And it's like my my hope is this is behind us for a while. But I can't begin to imagine our own players having to deal with this and consider their own mortality. You know, it's just one thing after another this year. 
And, and if you notice, it just every single hit got a little bit closer to home. And so I consider that when I think about let's get this signing class to bed and go win a ball game, and then maybe everybody can exhale and take a bit of a, you know, kind of a, you know, a, a time to let your spirit rest. Because it feels like everybody involved with Mississippi State football, including some of our fans, it's like all year we've been kind of like waiting for something good to happen to kind of get us over the hump. And even when we, we won the egg, there wasn't the normal jubilation with it. I think a part of it is because, yeah, we'd gone eight and four, but we probably left some, we left some money on the table, right? And there was all this angst and acrimony between the fan base about, oh, you know, Mike Leach needs to go. We're never going to get over the top. And it's like, well, yeah, but we're eight and four, but we should be 10 and two. But you didn't, you didn't predict 10 and two. You thought we'd be seven and five or six and six. And here we are beating your expectations, you know. And so there was all this division within the fan base about what's the proper direction for Mississippi State. So, so even, even then, winning the Egg Bowl wasn't enough to kind of quell some of that. And then Will Rogers, God bless Will Rogers. I mean, it's like he, he, has, he has been so wrongfully criticized by so many of our fans. And I have to think to myself, if he played – like if he was at Ole Miss putting up these kind of numbers – You'd be like, oh, my gosh, why didn't we recruit that guy? Because familiarity breeds contempt. And let's not forget Will Rogers was kind of thrown to the wolves in 2020. Did he make some mistakes this year? He absolutely did. But he's our quarterback. And I stand behind him. I support him. I do. And I support Leach's decision. Because, I, 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 listen, I'm in practice. I see these guys in practice. They're, and Will is head and shoulders better. We're not going to take a transfer portal quarterback unless something has changed here in the, next, uh, in the last couple of days. We're not going to do that. Will Rogers is your quarterback, and so I'm going to encourage you to get out there and support him. People are like, well, you know, he's limited. Every quarterback is limited in some respect. You're probably the only guy that I ever looked at in my life and, and said that guy's not limited. It's Michael Vick. You know, probably the greatest athlete to ever play a quarterback position. And he was still a little bit short, couldn't see over this big, tall lineman of the NFL. Everybody's got limitations. But Will Rogers is our guy, man. And Will Rogers was handpicked by Mike Leach as a recruit at Washington State. And of course, he inherits him here at Mississippi State. And I remember those first few practices, you know, we were talking about other quarterbacks, and he kept saying, Will Rogers, Will Rogers, Will Rogers. And we're all thinking, really? The freshman? Yeah, Will Rogers. Yeah, Will Rogers. And because Will Rogers ends up earning the number two spot, you had everybody else go get in the portal. A lot of you guys are rooting for Keaton. You're rooting for Garrett Schrader. It ends up being Will Rogers. Will beat out those two fan favorites. And he is your quarterback. And, yes, he has some limitations, but so does everybody else. And my hope is, is that, uh, you know, whoever we hire as an offensive coordinator can help Will take the next step. But I can assure you this. There is nobody that loves this university, loves his football program, loves his team more than Will Rogers. And the fact that he's got the Pirates endorsements, enough for me. People forget we only offer about a half dozen, you know, to maybe ten quarterbacks a year. And Mike Leach offered him at Washington State. It's time for us to get together and go play a ball game. And hopefully we can end this season on, on a positive note. And then again, maybe we put football on the back burner for a while. You know, we'll, we'll have some coaching news, that kind of stuff. We'll have uh, assistant coaches and things like that, coordinators. And then maybe we can rest for a bit and get ready for baseball, which is two months away. I can't wait. Absolutely cannot wait. So we'll be back on Monday. And uh, as, it, as, it, as it lies today, again, you'll get three shows next week. That's the plan, three shows. You'll get a Monday show, a Wednesday show at some point, probably Wednesday night, probably, because we've got to get through signing day and i got to get to my traveling destination. And then uh, we'll have the Friday show. I'll probably record that Thursday night. So, again, three shows next week, even though it's Christmas, and many of you will be traveling on Christmas, so I'll give you some things to listen to. Um, but, again, I've had so many of you reach out and uh, offer your support and your condolences. And, uh, again, my loss is very insignificant compared to the people that, you know, lived and worked with Mike Leach. But Mike was my friend. And I uh, had a very, very, very special conversation with Chris Lowe from ESPN uh, Chris hit me up, and we talked for a while, and, and he told me, he said, you know, I just want you to know, I'm sure you noticed already how much Coach uh, loved and respected you. 
And those are the things that matter. Because, like, you know, there, people can say anything to your face, right? And I don't walk around in my life wondering what people are saying behind my back. Maybe I did when I was in my 20s, but now that I'm, now that I'm half a century old, I don't really care about that. But when you find out that you've been given a genuine compliment behind your back, it means a little bit more, right? I mean, I love people saying things to my face, right? I love my wife and my kids say, tell me how much they love me. I do. I'm a words of affirmation guy, man. I need external validation. And you guys message me and tell me how much you like the books. That stuff matters to me. But you're saying it to me. I need to hear it. But when you find out that somebody that you love and respect <clears throat> has a similar admiration for you privately, it's very special. So thanks to everybody that has reached out. And so many people have said, you know what, Steve, I've just started listening to the show this week, which shame on you. But I love the podcast. I've had so many of you that have said, you know what, Steve, these last two shows have really helped me deal with some of this. And that was one of the reasons that I did it, as difficult as they were. And even today, getting behind this microphone wasn't the most fun thing to do. You know, at some point, you kind of get tired of talking about your pain, right? And you just want to heal a little bit. And so I thought today we would do a regular format show. We'll address the things that are important, but let's kind of begin to move forward. And again, that's in no disrespectful way to, to Mike Leach or his family. But life goes on. It does. As sad as all this is and as tragic and unexpected as it is, Mike would want us all to soldier on. He wouldn't want us to lay in the floor and sit around all day feeling sorry for ourselves. He certainly wouldn't expect that from his coaches and players. And I believe as a result, we're going to get the best effort we possibly can out of Mississippi State against Illinois. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.